very especially happy um, to have Jack Snyder as our, as our speaker today to give the Max Weber lecture on human rights for pragmatists. And I'll leave the floor to our, uh, one of our fellows, Miha Marchenko, who will be uh, giving, a, giving a broader uh, introduction of our uh, tonight's speaker. So please. Thank you. I am honored to present the speaker of this month's Max Weber lecture, Professor Jack Snyder, who is a Robert and Rene Balfour Professor of International Relations in the Department of Political Science and the Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies at Columbia University. It is also at Columbia University that he defended his PhD. Snyder's interests include international relations theory, post-Soviet politics, nationalism, and human rights. Professor Snyder is also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the editor of a W.W. Norton book series on world politics. His books include Electing to Fight, Why Emerging Democracies Go to War with Edward D. Mansfield, From Voting to Violence, Democratization of Nationalist Conflict, and Myths of Empire, Domestic Politics, and International Ambition. And he's also an editor of several books, including Human Rights Futures with Stephen Hopgood and Leslie Vinjamuri, and Ranking the World, Grading States as a Tool of Global Governance with Alexander Cooley. And today, he will give us a lecture based on his most recent book titled Human Rights for Pragmatists, Social Power in Modern Times, which was published by Princeton University Press in 2022. So without further ado, I would like to give the word to Professor Snyder and remind everyone that there will be half an hour time for questions at the end of his speech. Well, thank you so much. It really is a huge honor to be here giving a Max Weber lecture. Uh, when I told my colleagues at Columbia that I was giving a Max Weber lecture at EUI, they said, wow, that sounds amazingly grand. And little did they know that I was going to be, you know, doing it in front of a 17th century fresco in this marvelous room. So uh, let's hope I can uh, live up to the grandeur of the occasion and the surroundings. Uh, one thing I will say, uh, Max Weber is definitely relevant to the topic for today. Uh, you'll see on my PowerPoint slides, I actually have a picture of Max Weber, and I had it on my slides even before I knew that I would be giving such a thing as the Max Weber lecture. Uh, so thanks for that opportunity. Uh, I also want to express particular thanks to Miriam Golden, who helped uh, organize my coming uh, here. And I uh, also uh, am particularly interested in hearing from her since she's written one of the most important books on corruption and how to solve the problems of corruption. And uh, as you will hear during my talk, it's one of my favorite topics in the human rights context. So hopefully Miriam will speak up uh, at a certain point and engage with that issue. So liberalism, as pretty much everybody knows, is facing a moment of crisis. And part of this is that the enemies of liberalism turn liberalism's own message of civic and human rights back against it. They call human rights and liberalism a decadent, degenerate project hijacked by out-of-touch elites, pushing agendas that defy traditional common sense, uh, and that these human rights promoting liberals are imperialist bullies trying to replace national self-determination with a corrupt neoliberal cosmopolitanism. Well, human rights is indeed at the core of the liberal social order. 
But I argue in my book that the most vocal promoters of rights have often misunderstood the source of their own social power and persuasiveness. If you read a book um, by Arie Nair, the founder of Human Rights Watch on the origins of the human rights international movement, uh, he argues that it was moralism, legalism, secular universalism, aiming at justice for the weak, shaming the strong, and refusing to compromise on principle that gave the international human rights movement its power. Uh, when I was recruiting a research assistant among the Columbia undergraduates for this project, uh, I asked a very smart young woman if she would be interested in being my RA. And uh, she said, a project on human rights pragmatism? Oh, wait, that, that can't be right. Human rights is, by definition, idealistic, not pragmatic. And then I just said to her, ought implies can. And uh, she says, oh, I get it. And from then on, she was a terrific RA who uh, worked on uh, a, a lot of the, the stuff in the book very effectively. So um, principle does matter in promoting human rights, especially the aspirational role of principles such as those expressed in the Universal De Declaration of Human Rights. And these aspirations I think of as a direction-finding compass, uh, something that you have you know, out over the horizon, in the distance, as the goal that you're aiming for. But that's different than being the thing that helps you make uh, your path along the way, your tactics, your strategies to get to uh, that goal. Um, the power to get to the ultimate destination, I argue, is the self-interest of powerful majorities nationalism and national self-determination, often piggybacking on religious networks and religious ideas, sustained by progressive mass social movements, not just elite organizations of international lawyers or professional activists. And another very crucial step in the process is the alignment of the human rights movement with pragmatic reform parties which cut deals to gain power. So think of solidarity in Poland, the Congress party in India, uh, Mandela and the ANC in South Africa who bargained with the apartheid regime. Uh, Democrats in Chile who let Pinochet keep his immunity in the Chilean Senate. Even Eleanor Roosevelt herself agreed to cut explicit, explicit language in the UDHR that uh, out, would, would have uh, put the finger on the problem of racial equality because the Democrats' political coalition back home in the United States included Southern Democrats who would have been upset by that idea. So the vehicle for this power to promote human rights effectively came historically first from the rise of commercial classes in the early modern period who demanded property rights, the right of free contracting, due process, political representation, and freedom of the press. After that, it included the rise of the working class who demanded the right to collective bargaining and economic and social rights. So at this moment of crisis for liberalism, it's worth remembering liberalism's strengths. So first, 
liberalism's economic strength. No state has made it through the middle income trap without rights, except for oil producing states and Singapore. There's a choice point when states rise to uh, the, the point of one fourth US GDP per capita. And some successful states like Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan at that point make a conscious choice to shift from authoritarian strategies of political and economic development and adopt liberal rights-based strategies of development whole hog. Uh, not just the economics of contracting, but the whole thing. Um, the uh, advantages of backwardness in economic development run out of gas at one, for, one fourth of GDP per capita. Um, and the countries that don't make that shift wind up either stagnating or exploding in an orgy of aggression and nationalism. That is the historical track record uh, to date. The data on this chart is from David uh, Dollar's paper. He's a Brookings economist. Um, so the other uh, thing about the successes and strengths of liberalism that we shouldn't forget is that uh, rights-affirming liberal Democrats are the best realists. Liberal states have been on the winning side of six out of the last six hegemonic wars in the international system. Liberal states don't fight each other in war, the so-called democratic peace hypothesis uh, formulated by my colleague Michael Doyle back in the 80s, uh, and it's still true today, and it has been true for uh, as long as there have been democratic states. Uh, democracies stick together in alliances better than other kinds of states. They're pretty good at organizing cooperative economic uh, regimes. Uh, John Maynard Keynes uh, at Bretton Woods planning the post-war international economic order with Harry Dexter White from the US. Democracies threaten other states less than authoritarian states, and we're now proving this, um, you know, even as we speak, looking at the war in uh, Ukraine. So, it's, um, it's also, uh, we're, oh, I think I, I missed, No. Okay. Um, so it's also worth remembering that liberalism has its own internal contradictions too, especially the tension between liberty and equality, between political freedom and free markets uh, managed by the democratic welfare state. Uh, but now these tensions have been growing within the rise of the libertarian strand of liberalism. Um, these are tensions that foes of liberalism can exploit, complicating efforts to promote human rights. So the concept of modernity fame, um, frames my argument about rights and pragmatism processes of modernization populate the social landscape with groups and interests. And the logic of modernization affects the range of feasible strategies for creating social order, which all norms entrepreneurs, including human rights activists, need to take into account. So the question is,
What institutional or cultural features are needed to bring about modernization based on economic development and science and technology? So in the book, I talk about three forms of social order. Uh, one is pre-modern pre forms of social order based on repression, kinship, patronage, and in-group favoritism. In other words, personalistic social relations. And then I distinguish two forms of modern social relations both of them based on rationalization and rules. The first of these, drum roll please, is Max Weber's iron cage of bureaucracy, bureaucratic technocracy, um, which is the, the strategy of modernization that the People's Republic of China seems to be um, making its bets on. Uh, but the other form of modernity is liberal, impersonal, social relations with market transactions that are rule-governed, equality before the law, and accountable governance through some form of um, democratic or representative government. So how would a pragmatist go about advancing the project of rights-based modernity? So here uh, the game is to try to avoid backsliding into personalistic pre-modern patterns, but also to avoid getting stuck in Weber's iron cage which applies rules to hierarchical social relations but stops well short of liberalism's more extensive transformation to a rules and rights-based social order. So uh, first, a pragmatist would understand that such a transformation is not likely to be accomplished by going down a checklist of laws, institutions, and rules, putting them all in a delivery box, and shipping them, say, to Iraq or Afghanistan. Rather, a pragmatist is likely to take the view that some of the building blocks of, liber of the liberal order are preconditions for other building blocks. Uh, to paraphrase and caricature a bit, no economic development, no literate middle class, no equality before the law, no democracy, no rights. So in this view, various facilitating conditions need to be put in place to serve as supporting platforms for further steps on the path to a rights-based society. Liberal uh, democracy theorists like Robert Dahl uh, and conservative social theorists like Samuel Huntington actually agreed that the best sequence to move towards a democratic rights-based order is to start by building the liberal institutions for the elite, like Britain did with uh, law, the press, parliament, and so forth, and only later open up participation in those institutions to uh, the mass of the population. But today, that sequencing is almost impossible to pull off. So what sequence should pragmatists aim for? So many of the substantive chapters in my book show how economic development empowers interests for impersonal rule-based order. Uh, the chapters on democratization, the chapters on anti-corruption, uh, media, and women's rights all have an anchor in underlying processes of economic development, uh, which spawn social classes that have the interest and the outlook uh, to be in favor of rights, uh, often for themselves. 
Uh, still, these interests need to be mobilized into social movements and coalitions, which then uh, need to build institutions that can carry out these functions. So, uh, in the democratization chapter, I rely uh, somewhat on Kurt uh, Whelan's book, Making Waves, and he starts off with the revolutions of 1848 in Europe. And uh, he, he notes that uh, after the liberal democratic revolution in Paris in 1848, um, you know, the, the newspapers all across Europe were filled with excitement about these developments and everybody wanted to emulate the success of the liberal revolution in Paris. And so the, the urbanites, the bourgeoisie, the professional classes uh, all across Europe uh, said, hey, we want to have that here as well. And uh, they demanded constitutional government, parliaments, and uh, so forth. But uh, as Whalen points out, uh, this was all swept away inside of a year or two. Um, some of it was actually hijacked by uh, conservatives like uh, Otto von Bismarck, who said, oh, we can write a constitution, uh, we can have elections, but we can bend those rules in a way that actually supports the monarchy, supports the traditional ruling class, and creates a conservative, not a human rights-based uh, society. And so uh, Wayland contrasts uh, the quick collapse of the liberalizing uh, rights-based revolutions of 1848 with later waves of democratization after uh, countries in uh, Europe, in South America, elsewhere, had decades and decades to experiment with um, the formation of interest groups, coalitions among interest groups, to build institutions of law and governments, no, governance, no matter how flawed initially, no matter how prone to breakdown, uh, but eventually they created platforms for successful liberal demographic, uh, uh, democratic uh, transitions in many of these countries until, you know, by the 1990s, more than half of the countries in the world were democracies. And so uh, Whalen's point is that just having the, the goal, the aspirational moment of wanting a liberal uh, society uh, doesn't get you there. Uh, you need to do the long, hard work um, the, what Max Weber uh, s called politics, the, the long, hard, uh, boring of hard uh, boards to get the job done. Um, so um, one of the books that I relied on uh, for the corruption part of my argument makes a very similar argument about the quest for anti-corruption measures, uh, a shift from um, pers uh, personalistic patronage-based social relations, my pre-modern category, to uh, impersonal social relations, my liberal uh, modern category. And, uh, you know, her, her data, her analysis shows that uh, a degree of economic development in most places uh, is an underpinning of this move, although there are a lot of qualifications there. There's a lot of room for uh, who gets active politically and, uh, and takes the agency to work 
in their own interest, especially interest groups that are looking at the corruption and patronage system of the old regime and seeing how their own opportunities uh, to do well are being hamstrung by this system. They have an interest to seize the day and act against corruption and how they then uh, invest in uh, political coalition making and in institution building. Uh, Munju Papidi makes the argument that this happens uh, not all in one shot, and here Miriam may have a bone to pick with Munju Papidi and me, uh, but typically takes uh, a step-by-step -step approach. Now, one thing that is uh, a problem in thinking about this kind of transition from a patronage-based society to liberal modernity is that if it's going to take uh, a long period of time, if it's a step-by-step -step process of mobilizing interest groups, coalitions, and creating institutions that they can use to succeed, that there's the problem that um, um, the pre-modern, illiberal, authoritarian solution is a kind of social equilibrium where interests, privileges, and institutions kind of all work together. The liberal system is arguably a system where uh, freedom of speech, democratic participation, rule of law, all work together in a kind of equilibrium. But the transition from one to the other is a big, messy disequilibrium that has interests and coalitions and institutions and ideas that are all at cross purposes. They're mismatched with each other. So where are the handholds in this transition to modernity? Because if things are happening slowly and you want to advance the project of reform, you have to have something that looks like a partial equilibrium climbing up that uh, very difficult cliff. So uh, I want to give you eight steps to build a powerful self-interested coalition to climb the cliff. And um, I will zip through them uh, pretty quickly. Uh, so first, as I said before, an aspirational appeal to a core of supporters gives you that compass of a general direction to head in. Uh, it also gives you talking points to explain to people how compromises that you're making along the way are not sellouts, but are um, calculated to strengthen the pro-rights coalition and lead to the goal in the in the long run. Uh, so one of the bits of advice is after you've made that aspirational appeal, appeal to your base, uh, don't divide the base of your core supporters. Like Abraham Lincoln accused the abolitionist party, the Liberty Party, of doing uh, in the 1844 presidential election when a pro-slavery Democrat, James K. Polk, defeated a kind of wishy-washy, uh, waffling on slavery Whig Party candidate, Henry Clay, uh, in a very close election where, and so, you, you may know the U.S. crazy elect electoral vote system for voting uh, for, for presidents. This was a classic case where 
Clay, the kind of wishy-washy anti-slavery guy uh, who did not want slavery to expand westward, lost the election to the slavery expansion guy, Polk, by um, 1% of the vote in the state of New York, which was the decisive swing vote in the electoral college in that election. And um, the Liberty Party, the anti-slavery uh, abolitionist party that would make no compromise and vote for Clay, um, got 3% of the vote. And so that's why Clay lost New York and that's why Polk won the election. Um, the result of this was that he started with a, a he started a war with Mexico, which helped open the doors to the expansion of slavery westward, which caused the uh, end of the the containment of slavery and led pretty directly to the Civil War. Um, so Lincoln. Uh, looked at this and uh, said uh, in his consequentialist ethic against the uh, self-defeating moralistic uh, purity of the abolitionists, the, the tree is known uh, by its fruit. Okay, uh, similar strategic point is um, also, Abraham Lincoln, make opportunistic deals for fence sitters. So the workers, the industrial laborers in the north of the United States, uh, pretty much hated the abolitionists. Uh, the biggest funders of abolitionism were wealthy industrialists who were the employers of the northern working class. Uh, and um, they, you know, for idealistic reasons, liked the abolitionists and supported them. And this angered the industrial working class of the North, uh, who were very poorly paid and were, you know, wondering why their employers weren't using their money to increase their own wages rather than to give them to the abolitionists. Uh, Lincoln came up with a formula that was anti-slavery but attractive to the northern working class uh, and running for president and debating uh, Douglas in 1858 uh, and in 1860 in the presidential election, uh, Lincoln made the point that um, blocking the expansion of slavery to the West would be uh, a huge benefit for the northern white working class because otherwise they would have to compete with slave labor for land and, and uh, opportunities in the American West. And uh, so this was a, a direct appeal to the northern working class that really did not have an idealistic bone in their body uh, against slavery, but they did want to have this opportunity to go west for their future economic prospects. And they bought Lincoln's, um, Lincoln's argument and elected uh, him as the anti-slavery candidate. So similar uh, kind of argument is don't alienate swing voters gratuitously. Uh, here's Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, back in her younger days, she actually thought that Roe v. Wade was before its time. Uh, it wasn't so much that she thought that it was argued badly in terms of the law, uh, but she just thought that the American people were not ready for it and that it would cause a backlash against uh, progressive uh, law on social issues, that it would 
entrench a kind of backward-looking um, political coalition. And, uh, well, you know, I, I'm not saying that she was right one way or the other, but she certainly was right that uh, Roe v. Wade helped entrench anti-abortion as um, um, a major mobilizing strategy for uh, what we've seen as the emerging you know, Republican coalition. And you know, we've, we've seen where that leads. Uh, so the other, th the other thing to avoid is shaming shameless leaders or especially illiberal cultures. So one of the things that I did in the book was just to um, look at some randomly selected Human Rights Watch reports. And, uh, you know, I, my question was, well, Human Rights Watch says that it's in favor of naming and shaming uh, perpetrators of abuses and human rights uh, violators, but, you know, are they really, like, shaming people? And so after having kind of randomly picked a bunch of uh, Human Rights Watch reports, uh, I found that um, pretty often they were um, criticizing socially embedded illiberal practices that human rights people would call human rights abuses, um, you know, criticizing um, uh, Polish priests for demonizing women, um, criticizing um, the, the uh, anti-cow uh, killer vigilantes in India. And um, you know, I'm not saying that these practices are not human rights abuses, that they're not worthy of criticism. I'm certainly not saying that the human rights reports were like inaccurate in, in any way. They're very professional. Nonetheless, the, a lot of these reports were pointing to culturally embedded practices that um, there's, was essentially, you know, not just calling out like one bad leader, uh, but was identifying essentially practices that they considered human rights violations, but that the cu culture in hand was like accustomed to, to doing. Um, so instead of shaming people, um, which tends to cause backlash uh, and plays into the hands of um, traditional elites that can portray themselves as protecting the local culture against hegemonic liberal overlords and neo-imperialism, much better to lead with popular issues like uh, anti-corruption um, or um, labor rights. So in, in um, arguing for uh, labor rights, uh, one question that you might want to consider is, well, whose labor rights? Over the last couple of years, we've been hearing a lot about um, Uyghur slave labor in China. Um, but we haven't been hearing nearly as much about just um, um, international labor organization standards that uh, China is not observing with respect to the majority of Chinese workers. Um, even though we know that Chinese workers are allegedly quite unhappy with their pay and their working conditions, there's the lie down flat movement in China. You would think that, that uh, promoting a concern for labor conditions among all Chinese workers would be um, an important theme, whereas focusing mainly on slave labor among Uyghurs, it's a, like, a much more uh, dramatic kind of abuse. But on the other hand, it's 
not an issue that the majority of Chinese people um, are likely to fully identify with. Um, there's a great new book by Jamie Griffith Jones on uh, rights in China, and he points out that there are some rights that do get mentioned by international uh, commentators and activists that the that the Chinese people um, find popular. And these are certain kinds of women's rights uh, and environmental uh, pollution rights. And uh, Griffith Jones shows that those rights, the Chinese government does not um, uh, suppress discussion of in the same way it uh, does say civil liberties types of rights. Uh, and it's because it, uh, says Griffith Jones, it's because the Chinese government knows that these issues are popular with their own people and they don't want to get on the wrong side of that kind of human rights discourse. Uh, so, uh, Seventh recommendation, try to persuade locals in the normative vernacular. Uh, this is a picture from a women's health clinic in Egypt. One of the people that I interviewed and invited to a meeting was a medical doctor at the major Sunni Muslim university in, um, in, in Cairo, who made an impassioned speech at a human rights meeting that I had organized. And he said, you know, don't complain if uh, Muslim countries like Egypt have reservations on certain kinds of human rights uh, provisions based on the Muslim religion. Because, you know, that sets up a direct conflict between international human rights law and my work uh, as a guy who's trying to set up uh, human uh, uh, health clinics in uh, rural Egypt uh, as uh, a way of advancing towards the same goals of the right to women's health that human rights organizations have. It's just that uh, this uh, professor, doctor, his writings on the subject would start with many pages of what the Quran really says about uh, women and women's health issues, and then ends with a bunch of pages about uh, science and uh, medical treatments. And uh, he says, you know, that's, that's the way to connect vernacular to uh, convincing science and uh, it sells much better and just denouncing us for having uh, reservations on like Western uh, terminology is um, gonna make my work harder. Uh, so, uh, finishing up here, uh, keep the central operating systems of liberalism functioning. Uh, the most important thing that liberal human rights revering states can do to advance human rights in the world is to make sure that it, its security systems, its international economic systems, its international news systems are actually functioning well and getting good results by instantiating uh, effective liberal principles so that um, countries that l lack those opportunities can look at the liberal systems that run so much of the globe and say, yes, I would like to join this. Um, this means, however, reforming those aspects of the international economic order that foster corruption. Um, and that so disinformation and hate speech uh, in global media. 
Uh, so I think you know one of the reasons that we have problems with liberalism is that in this day and age there's libertarianism, uh, which believes that uh, you don't really need to regulate the markets, neither the marketplace for goods nor the marketplace of ideas, but anything goes and it'll lead to some Pareto optimal outcome automatically by the invisible hand. Um, previously, we had something that international relations scholars in the US call embedded liberalism, the idea that liberal norms and rights need to be embedded in governance and regulatory systems that um, are a more active hand to make sure that you get a good result. Uh, so my final uh, point is that once you get the liberal systems up and running effectively, then you can just have an open door policy and tell countries around the world that when you want to and when you're ready, we actually have functioning systems that you will profit from and that you will be able to use as an international engine that will help you uh, reform. And that this is much more important than uh, the human rights activism of the hard sell. Uh, knocking on the door of uh, other countries' uh, borders and telling them, uh, let, let us human rights activists in and tell you uh, how it is that you should modernize. Uh, so uh, with that, thank you uh, very much and I look forward to you know, your, your comments, so dive in.